preface of a radiation sand and spray this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo radiations sand and spray by john gould fletcher preface the art of poetry as practice in the english-speaking countries today is in a greatly backward state among the reading public there are exactly three opinions generally held about it the first and by far the most popular view is that all poets are fools and that poetry is absurd the second is that poetry is an agreeable after-dinner entertainment and that a poet is great because he has written quotable lines the last and worst is that which strives to press the poet into the service of some philosophical dogma ism or fad for these views the poets themselves and no others are largely responsible with their exaggerated vanity they have attempted to make of their craft a masonic secret iterating that a poet composes by ear alone that rhythm is not to be analyzed that rhyme is sacrosanct that poets by some special dispensation of providence write by inspiration being born with more insight than other men and so forth is it any wonder that the public is indifferent hostile or befooled when poets themselves disdain to explain clearly what they are trying to do and refuse to admit the public into the privacy of their carefully guarded workrooms it was theophile gautier i think who offered to teach anyone how to write poetry in twenty-five lessons now this view has in it some exaggeration but at the same time much truth no amount of lessening will turn an idiot into a wise man or enable a man to say something when he is naturally one who has nothing to say nevertheless i believe that there would have been fewer mute and glorious miltons greater respect paid to poetry and many better poets if the poets themselves had stopped working through sheer instinct and set themselves the task of considering some elementary principles in their craft in this belief and in the hope of enlightening someone as to the aim and purpose of my work i am writing this preface to begin with the basis of english poetry is rhythm or as some would prefer to call it cadence this rhythm is obtained by mingling stressed and unstressed syllables stress may be produced by accent it may and often is produced by what is known as quantity the breath required to pronounce certain syllables being more than is required on certain others however it be produced it is precisely this insistence upon cadence upon the rhythm of the line when spoken which sets poetry apart from prose and not be it said at the outset a certain way of printing with a capital letter at the beginning of each line or an insistence upon end rhymes now this rhythm can be made the same in every line of the poem this was the aim of alexander pope for instance my objection to this method is that it is both artificial and unmusical in the case of the eighteenth century men it gave the effect of a perfectly balanced pattern like a minuet or fugue in the case of the modern imitator of kipling or masefield it gives the effect of monotonous ragtime in neither case does it offer full scope for emotional development i maintain that poetry is capable of as many gradations in cadence as music is in time we can have a rapid group of syllables what is called line succeeded by a slow heavy one like the swift scurrying up of the wave 
in the sullen dragging of itself away or we can gradually increase or decrease our tempo creating accelerando and rallentando effects or we can follow a group of rapid lines with a group of slow ones or a single slow or vice versa finally we can have a perfectly even and unaltered movement throughout if we desire to be monotonous the good poem is that in which all these effects are properly used to convey the underlying emotions of its author and that which welds all these emotions into a work of art by the use of dominant motif subordinate themes proportionate treatment repetition variation what in music is called development reversal of roles and return in short the good poem fixes a free emotion or a free range of emotions into an inevitable and artistic whole the real secret of the greatest english poets lies not in their views on life which were naturally only those which every sane man is obliged to hold but in their profound knowledge of their craft whereby they were enabled to put forth their views in perfect form each era of man has its unique and self-sufficing range of expression and experience and therefore every poet must seek anew for himself out of the language medium at his disposal rhythms which are adequate and forms which are expressive of his own unique personality as regards the length of the lines themselves that depends altogether upon the apparatus which nature has given us to enable us to breathe and to speak each line of a poem however many or few its stresses represents a single breath and therefore a single perception the relation between breath and perception is a commonplace of oriental philosophy as we breathe so do we know the universe whether by sudden powerful gust of inspiration or through the calmer but rarer gradual ascent into the hidden mysteries of knowledge and slow falling away therefrom into the darkness so much for the question of meter the second range of problems with which we are immediately concerned when we examine the poetic craft is that which is generally expressed under the name of rhyme now rhyme is undoubtedly an element of poetry but it is neither an indissoluble element nor is it in every case an inevitable one in the main the instinct which makes for rhyme is sound poetry is an art which demands though not invariably the utmost richness and fullness of musical effect when rhyme is considered as an additional instrument of what may be called the poetic orchestra it both loses and gains in importance it loses because it becomes of no greater import than assonance consonance alliteration and a host of similar devices it gains because it is used intelligently as a device for adding richness of effect instead of blindly as a mere tag at the end of a line the system which demands that the end of every line of poetry must rhyme with the end of someone preceding or following it has not even the merit of high antiquity or of civilized adherence in its essence it is barbarous it derives from the stamping of feet clapping of hands pounding of drums or like devices of savage peoples to mark the rhythms in their dances and songs and its introduction into european poetry as a rule to be invariably fouled dates precisely from the time of the break-up of the latin civilization and the approach of what the historians know as the dark ages since it has come into common use among european peoples every poet of eminence has tried to avoid its fatiguing monotony by constructing new stanza forms 
dante petrarch chaucer spencer all these were innovators or developers of what may be known as formal meter but let us not forget that the greatest of all shakespeare used rhyme in his plays only as additional decoration to a lyric or in a perfectly legitimate fashion as marking the necessary pause at the close of a scene let us also remember that as he advanced in thought and expression he gradually abandoned rhyme for the only reason that an artist abandons anything because it was no longer adequate the process that began with the perfigilium veneris the medieval hymn writers and the provencal troubadours and which culminated in the orchestral blank verse of shakespeare has now passed through all the stages of reduction to formula eclecticism archaistic reaction vulgarization gramophone popularity and death milton gibbon among poets reduced it to his too monotonous organ roll dryden pope and his followers endlessly repeated a formula blake wordsworth coleridge attempted a return to the elizabethan and to the even earlier ballad forms in the later nineteenth century we come back to still earlier forms ballads rondos even sestinas appear gradually we find the public attention dropping away from these juggling feats performed with stale form and turning to what may be called the new balladist the street singer who is content to doggeralize and make strident a once noble form we have our macefields our kiplings and worse ragtime has at last made its appearance in poetry let us be grateful to the man who invented it nicholas vachel lindsay but let us admit that the force of nature can no further go it is time to create something new it is time to strip poetry of meaningless tatters of form and to clothe her in new suitable garments portents and precursors there have been in plenty we already have blake matthew arnold whitman samuel butler and i know not how many more everyone is talking many poets poeticules and poetasters are writing what they call free verse let there be no mistake about one thing free verse that is flabby inorganic shapelessly obvious is as much of a crime against poetry as the cheapest echo of a mace field that any doggerel scribbler ever strummed let poets drop their formulas free or otherwise and determine to discipline themselves through experiment there is much to be learned from the precursors i have mentioned there is a great deal to be learned from the french poets parnassians symbolists whitmanites fantasists who have in the years eighteen sixty to nineteen hundred created a new renaissance under our noses but above all what will teach us the most is our language and life never was life lived more richly more fully with more terrible blind intensity than it is being lived at this instant never was the noble language which is ours surpassed either in richness or in concision we have the material with which to work and the tools to do the work with it is america's opportunity to lay the foundations for a new flowering of english verse and to lay them as broad as they are strong january 1915 end of preface Chapter One of Irradiations, Sand and Spray by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. 
Irradiations, Parts 1 through 12. 1. The spattering of the rain upon pale terraces of afternoon is like the passing of a dream amid the roses shuddering against the wet green stalks of the streaming trees. The passing of the wind upon the pale lower terraces of my dream is like the crinkling of the wet gray robes of the hours that come to turn over the urn of the day and spill its rainy dream. Vague movement over the puddled terraces, heavy gold pennons, a pomp of solemn gardens half hidden under the liquid veil of spring. Far trumpets, like a vague rout of faded roses, burst against the wet green silence of distant forests. A clash of cymbals, then the swift, swaying footsteps of the wind that undulates along the languid terraces. Pools of rain, the vacant terraces, wet, chill, and glistening towards the sunset beyond the broken doors of today. 2. Gaunt sails, bronze boats of the evening, float along the river where aloft like dim swans the clouds die softly. I am afraid to traverse the long still streets of evening, for I fear to see the ghosts that stare at me from the shadows. I will stay indoors instead and await my wandering dream. She is about me, fluid yet and formless. The wind in her hair whispers like dim violins, and the faint glint of her eyes shifts like a sudden movement over the surface of a dark pool. She comes to me slowly down the lost streets of the evening, and their immutable silence is in her feet. Let no lamps flare. Be still, my heart. Hands, stay. For I would touch the lips of my new love with my lips. 3. In the gray skirts of the fog, sea mews scurl desolately and flick like bits of paper propelled by a wind about the flabby sails of a departing ship crawling slowly down the low reaches of the river. About the keel there's a bubbling and gurgling of grumpy water, and as the prow noses out away for itself, it seems to weave a dream of bubbles and flashing foam a dream of strange islands whereto it is bound. Pear islands, drenched with the dawn, the palms flash under the immense dark sky, down which the sun dives to embrace the earth. Drums boom in conscious bray, and with a crash of crimson cymbals suddenly appears above the polished backs of slaves, a king in a breastplate of gold gigantic amid tossed roses and swaying dancers that melt into pale undulations and muffled echoes mid the bubbling of the muddy lumpy water and the swirling of the sea mews above the sullen river four the iridescent vibrations of midsummer light dancing dancing suddenly flickering and quivering like little feet or the movement of quick hands clapping or the rustle of fur billows or the clash of polished gems the palpitant mosaic of the midday light colliding sliding leaping and lingering oh i could lie on my back all day and mark the mad ballet of the midsummer sky. 5. Over the rooftops race the shadows of clouds. Like horses, the shadows of clouds charge down the street. 
whirlpools of purple and gold, winds from the mountains of cinnabar, lacquered mandarin moments, palanquins swaying and balancing amid the vermilion pavilions against the jade balustrades, glint of the glittering wings of dragonflies in the light, silver filaments, golden flakes settling downwards, rippling quivering flutters, repulse and surrender, the sun broidered upon the rain, the rain rustling with the sun. Over the rooftops race the shadows of clouds, like horses the shadows of clouds charge down the street. 6. The balancing of gaudy, broad pavilions of summer against the insolent breeze. The bellying of the sides of striped tents, swelling taut, shuddering in quick collapse, silent under the silence of the sky. Earth is streaked and spotted with great splashes and dapples of sunlight. The sun throws an immense circle of hot light upon the world rolling slowly in ponderous rhythm, darkly, musically forward. All is silent under the steep cone of afternoon. The sky is imperturbably profound. The ultimate divine union seems about to be accomplished. All is troubled at the attainment of the inexhaustible infinite. The rolling and the tossing of the sides of immense pavilions under the whirling wind that screams up the cloudless sky. 7. Flickering of incessant rain on flashing pavements. Sudden scurry of umbrellas. Bending, recurved blossoms of the storm. The winds came clanging and clattering from long white high roads whipping in ribbons up summits. They strew upon the city gusty wafts of apple blossom, and the rustling of innumerable translucent leaves. Uneven tinkling, the lazy rain dripping from the eaves. 8. The fountain blows its breathless spray from me to you and back to me. Whipped, tossed, curdled, crashing, quivering, I hurl kisses like blows upon your lips. The dance of a bee drunken with sunlight, her radiant ecstasies, white and gold, sigh and relapse. The fountain tosses pallid spray far in the sorrowful, silent sky. 9. The houses of the city no longer hum and play. They lie like careless, drowsy giants, dumb, estranged. One presses to his breast his toy, a lighted pain. One stirs uneasily. One is cold in death. And the late moon, fearfully peering over an immense shoulder, Sees, in the shadow below, the unpeopled hush of a street. 10. The trees, like great jade elephants, chained, stamp and shake neath the gadflies of the breeze. The trees lunge and plunge, unruly elephants. The clouds are their crimson howdah canopies. The sunlight glints like the golden robe of a shah. Would I were tossed on the wrinkled backs of those trees. 11. The clouds are like a somber sea. On shining screens of ebony are carven marvels of my heart. Against crimson plaques of cinnabar, shrills like a diamond. Dawn's last star. The gardens of my heart are green. The rain drips off the glistening leaves. In the humid gardens of my soul, 
the crimson peonies explode i am like a drop of rose-flushed rain clinging to crimson petals of love in the afternoon over gold screens i will brush the blue dust of my dreams twelve the pine rough-bearded pan of the woods whispered in my ear his sleepy sweet song like liquid fire it ran through my veins thus he piped sad lonely son of the woods lie down in the long still grass and sleep ere the dawn has hidden her swelling breast ere the morning has covered her massive flanks with a flame-colored mantle of noon lie down in the dewless grass nor awake to see whether afternoon has hurried in from the rim of her purple robe dropping dim flowers golden flowers with pollen dusty cups flowers of silence heed not though eve should sail a gray swan in the pool of the sky spreading low ripples heed these not only awake when slim twilight plunges her body in the last blown spray of the sun awake then for twilight and dawn are your day therefore lie down in the long dim grass and sleep and i will blow my low pipes over you end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Irradiations, Sand and Spray by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Irradiations, Parts 13 through 24. 13. As I went through the city by day, I saw shadows in sunlight, but in the night I saw everywhere stars within the darkness, a coldly fluting breeze, dark pan under the trees, low laughter, up the sky a star like a street lamp left on high. As I went through the city by day, I was hustled by jostling people. But in the night, the wind of the darkness whispered, Hush, to my soul. 14. Brown bed of earth, still fresh and warm with love, now hold me tight. Broad field of sky, where the clouds laughing move, fill up my pores with light. You trees, now talk to me chatter and scold or weep or drowsing stand you winds now play with me you wild things creep you boulders bruise my hand i now am yours and you are mine it matters not what gods herein i see you grow in me i am rooted to this spot we drink and pass the cup immortally. 15. O oh, seated grass, you army of little men crawling up the long slope with quivering, quick blades of steel. You who storm millions of graves, tiny green tentacles of earth, interlace yourselves tightly over my heart and do not let me go. For I would lie here forever and watch with one eye the pilgrimaging ants in your dull, savage jungles. The while with the other I see the stiff lines of the slope break in midair, a wave surprisingly arrested. And above them, wavering, dancing, bodiless, colorless, unreal, the long, thin, lazy fingers of the heat. 
16. An ant crawling up a grass blade, and above it the sky. I shall remember these when I die, an ant and a butterfly, and the sky. The grass is full of forget-me-nots and poppies. Through the air darts many a fly. The ant toils up its grass blade. The careless hours go by. The grass blades bow to the feet of the lazy hours. They walk out of the wood, showering shadows on flowers. The robes flutter vaguely, far off there in the clearing. I see them sometimes from the corner of my eye. 17. The wind that drives the fine dry sand across the strand. The sad wind spinning arabesque with a wrinkled hand. Labyrinths of shifting sand, the dancing dunes. I will arise and run with the sand, and gather it greedily in my hand. I will wriggle like a long yellow snake over the beaches. I will lie curled up, sleeping, and the wind shall chase me far inland. My breath is the music of the mad wind, shrill piping, stamping of drunken feet, the fluttering, tattered broidery flung over the dunes' steep escarpments, the fine, dry sand that whistles down the long, low beaches. 18. Blue, brown, blue, sky, sand, sea. I swell to your immensity. I will run over the endless beach. I will shout to the breaking spray. I will touch the sky with my fingers. My happiness is like this sand. I let it run out of my hand. 19. The clouds pass over the polished mirror of the sky. The clouds pass puffs of gray. There is no star. The clouds pass slowly. Suddenly a disengaged star flashes. The night is cold and the clouds roll slowly over the sky. 20. I dance. I exist in motion. A wind-shaken flower spilling my drops in the sunlight. I feel the muscles bending, relaxing beneath me. I direct the rippling sweep of the lines of my body. Its impact crashes through the thin walls of the atmosphere. I dance. About me whirls the somber hall, the gaudy stage, the harsh glare of the footlights. And in the brains of thousands watching, Little flames leap quivering to the music of my effort. I have danced. I have expressed my soul in unbroken rhythm, sorrow, and flame. I am tired. I would be extinguished beneath your beating hands. 21. Not noisily, but solemnly and pale. In a meditative ecstasy you entered life. As performing some strange rite to which you alone held the clue, Child, life did not give rude strength to you. From the beginning you would seem to have thrown away, As something cold and cumbersome, that armor men use against death. You would perhaps look on him face to face, And so learn the secret whether the face wears oftenest a smile or no. Strange, old, and silent being, there is something infinitely vast in your intense tininess. I think you could point out, with a smile, some curious star far off in the heavens, which no man has seen before. 22. 
The morning is clean and blue, and the wind blows up the clouds. Now my thoughts gathered from afar, once again in their patched armor, with rusty plumes and blunted swords, move out to war. Smoking our morning pipes, we shall ride two and two through the woods, for our old cause keeps us together, and our hatred is so precious, not death or defeat can break it. God willing, we shall this day meet that old enemy who has given us so many a good beating. Thank God we have a cause worth fighting for, and a cause worth losing, and a good song to sing. 23. Torridly the moon rolls upward against the smooth immensity of midsummer sky, changeless, inexhaustible. The city beneath is still. Heaven and earth are clasped together. Momently life grows as careless as the life of the intense stars. Out of the house is climbing, fuming up windows, flickering from every rooftop, rigid on sonorous pinnacles, silently swirl aloft love's infinite flamelets. 24. O oh, all you stars up yonder, do you hear me, beautiful, winking, sullen eyes? I am tired of seeing you in the same old places, night after night in the sky. I hoped you would dance, but after twenty-six years I find you are determined to stay as you are. So I make it known to you, stars clustered or solitary, that I want you to fall into my lap tonight. Come down, little stars, let me play with you. I will string you like beads and shovel you together, and wear you in my ears and scatter you over people and toss you back, like apples, if I choose. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Irradiations, Sand and Spray by John Gould Fletcher This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo Irradiations, Parts 25 through 36. 25. As I wandered over the city through the night, I saw many strange things. But I have forgotten all except one painted face. Gaudy, shameless night orchid, heavy, flushed, sticky with narcotic perfume. There was something in you which made me prefer you above all the feeble forget-me-nots of the world. You were neither burnt out nor pallid. There was plain, coarse, vulgar meaning in every line of you, and no make-believe. You were at least alive, when all the rest were but puppets of the night. 26. Slowly along the lamp-emblazoned street, amid the last sad drifting crowds of midnight, like lost souls wandering, comes marching by solemnly, as for some gem-bedecked ritual of old, a monotonous procession of black carts full crowded with blood-red blossom, scarlet geraniums unfolding their fiery globes upon the night. These are the memories of day molded in jagged flame. Lust, joy, blood, and death. With crushed hands, weary eyes, and hoarse clamor, we consecrate and acclaim them tumultuously ere they pass, contemptuous, beyond the unpierced veil of silence. 27. I think there was an hour in which God laughed at me, for as I passed along the street, 
saw that all the women, although their bodies were dexterously concealed, were thinking with all their might what men were like. 